these last two sessions, we're really going to take a kind of a tangent to... I'll bring it in. Absolutely. To what, what's going to happen next in the industry. Uh, Ridian's talked a little bit about the importance of, of marketplaces and how markets can provide discipline and transparency. I want to also talk a bit about, we've looked at the growth opportunities and we've identified small to medium-sized enterprises as a particularly huge growth opportunity. And what I want to look at here with Jay, now Jay is probably one of America's preeminent coaches working with small and medium-sized enterprises, work with, not unfair to say, hundreds, if not thousands? Uh, 465 industries. Ah, okay, there we are. Um, at a senior level, of C, uh, working with CEOs. So Jay's in a perfect position to, uh, as, as a coach, as a mentor, advisor, and a whole range of things. And it's a perfect position to get inside the mindset of entrepreneurs. So if, we're, if the industry is going to start selling to entrepreneurs, which it needs to, what's it going to have to do? Uh, Jay's in a good position to answer that question. You've been sitting here listening to all these marketplaces, telling you that the opportunity is around on, uh, uh, businesses. What do you think is going to be the challenge of getting inside the entrepreneur's mindset? What are the issues that they're going to face in terms of dealing with all these platforms who are going to want to market to them? Well, I mean, we talked, you and I, a little bit yesterday. Uh, the first one is getting them to trust you. Yeah. And getting them to trust you enough to want to do the transaction with you. And I think that's really big. And being able to get them to trust you to do the transaction with you in a cost-effective way. Yeah. How do they build that trust? Okay, I'm glad you asked, and I made some notes, so bear with me because I want to give you a lot of value. The first one is, and this is going to be for both of you, I know there's institutional investors, hedge funds, platforms, people in between, so I'm going to give you a duality of perspective. If I were, I'm not, if I were a platform and I wanted them to trust me, the first thing I would do is be explicit about my intention. I would say, I want to be your most trusted advisor. And as such, I'm going to invest in your future because I know your successful future is tied to mine. So I would establish the game rules from the beginning. That's the first thing I would do. SMEs don't really trust banks and institutions. They trust word of mouth, referrals. They trust organizations that they deal with. They trust media they respect, and they trust iconic uh, forces that, that they relate to. So I would preemptively not go and even try and source people in normal media. I would either align joint venture, partner, private label, all of the above with influences, and I'll tell some stories to validate that, but you talked earlier about millennials. I happen to just quite accidentally I mentor Damon John from Shark Tank, and I also mentor a young man named Ramit Sethi, who happens to own 500,000 millennials, and he's best friends with Tim Ferriss, who owns. But I would have people like that. I would build, we've done this many times, advisory boards of all kinds of iconic people that, that um, they respect and whose combined aggregate trust can be uh, directed towards that. I would leverage off of hundreds of millions of dollars that other people have met, have invested to basically access, gain trust, credibility with the market they want. I would create a position. I, I'm, it depends on the market. I mean, SME, small and medium, is a big arc. It can be a million-dollar business. It can be a $5 million business. It can be a $50 million business. What I wish I could have done was ask a lot of clarifying questions. I haven't a clue, you know, what your criteria is going to be, but you're going to have a lot of interaction with these people. It's not just going to be, I don't think, program in and just get a couple of autoresponders and then a check gets written. And so you're going to have to be really, building trust starts with being, being seen as a trusted advisor who clearly understands, appreciates, and could demonstrate that I really get who you are, what you are, why you are, what you want to do. And I'll give you more marketing strategy, but you've got to put into words what they feel. And that requires you to understand it's not just a transaction. I think a lot of the things that I was watching, they were cool theoretically, David, but they really didn't resonate to what I know about the mentality. That's And I circled a bunch of things to, to uh, go over. So you've got to give enormous value. If I were doing it, I'm not doing it. I would decide, do I want people who are already active borrowers? Do I want people who are totally, totally bankable but have never 
borrowed for any of the five or six applications? Do I want to grow new borrowers? Do I want to take people who are marginal but show them ways they could be very bankable by doing things? Because I don't know the market. I'm just trying to give you a bunch of different ideas. Either way, I would create value added that they really respected. And what that can be is educating them in ways nobody else does. Bringing them to your, if it's, you know, if it's site, bringing it with incredible stuff. You have to realize that the big difference between a big corporation and an, and an SME, SMB is they don't invest very much, most of them, in their own self-training, in their own growth, in their development. They have very limited, very limited infrastructure, so they don't have 9 million people. By the way, parenthetically, the SME marketing manager at most institutions, large it's like a turnstile. They don't stay very long. It's very demeaned and not a very high growth position. So you don't get a lot of great people. That's a great advantage if you're going to fund uh, a, a site or a platform or you're going to get one. But I would basically create all, the, I would get all, like, I'll tell you what we were planning on doing. I told you this. When, when we thought that uh, Title III was going to be right away, I already lined up. I've helped, by the way, it's 465 companies, but I've helped about 400 top experts over my life. My life's been 40 years, so it's a long time. But I have access to all kinds of expertise. We were going to create the ultimate repository. This was for for unaccredited investors. We are going to go with three ways. We are going to teach people who are trying to raise money how to get into the mines. We are going to have all these uh, people teach them how to pitch, how to basically make propositions that were irresistible, how to do tranches, how to overcome risk in the minds of the investor. We're going to teach the investors who were not really sophisticated investors how to judge things. So it's about education. It's about massive education, but stuff that, I mean, it's about adding value and understanding what value can really mean, in this case, to the SME. And it's about not just adding value about helping them facilitate an easy transaction, but adding value to help their business. For example, I mean, there's two ways basically a business can grow. They can borrow money to invest in new things, or they can make what they're doing right now perform better. Well, if you help them with what they've got right now perform better, you are going to win their trust. And what I deal with is we deal in making strategy perform better, making marketing perform better, making prospects convert better, making you know, the back end resell better, all kinds of things. It's very doable. I came from a background, one of my clients was Deming, and Deming was the father of process improvement and, and highest and best use theory and optimization. And most SMEs don't know anything about it. They also are terrible strategists. If it's a family-owned business, it's a generational. Everyone wants all the dividends out. They want all, and, and so they're not reinvesting. They're only getting maybe 20% of the yield out of the talent. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of leverages you can give them. And if you think about the fact that the ones that pay to go to seminars and things cost a lot of money, takes a lot of time, you can give them that kind of education. Let me give you four examples real quick, and then I can go on and on. But I can tell you some of the attributes of trust building, too. But I've got 15 or, or 10 minutes left. So a couple of real success stories. Uh, I have a candy company, I've told this earlier, in China that went from number five uh, to number one, and they sold for $500 million to Hershey's last year. They came to my seminar. It's not a client, but they use my stuff. They used to always just go and say, buy my candy, buy my candy. And everybody was saying, buy my candy. And in China, they have 20,000 little candies, retail stores. They don't do it in the groceries like we do. And they realized that they needed a reason why the candy shop should buy their candy. Reason why it drives everything. If you want to be the most trusted advisor, you've got to give them a reason why, and you've got to be able to prove it. These guys went to the candy stores and said, we don't want you just to buy our candy. We're going to grow your candy stores. And by growing your candy stores, we know if you never give us another percentage of your, of your uh, buy, we're still going to rise, but we hope we earn more of your business by doing it. And they grew all these candy stores, and they had businesses doubled and redoubled again. Uh, we sold one time very high-end technical uh, equipment to chiropractors, and the deal was that if they would buy the, that, we'd give them two years of marketing uh, expensive support gratis. We created one time a, um, a merchant bank credit card processing deal, and everybody was trying to basically shave two percentage or mills off of the deal, and we said, that doesn't make any sense. So we created 
thousands of uh, pieces of resource to help them make more money, manage better, cut their costs, turn their inventory. And we, as long as they did a certain minimum with us, they got it free. We had a dental supply, more than its last one, I'll tell. We had a dental supply company that basically was competing viciously, and they uh, were all basically trying to squeeze you know, the margin. And, and instead, we didn't do that. We went out and we retained the number one dental um, accounting firm, the number one dental practice building firm, uh, the number one um, recruiting firm of, of uh, dental dentists, and we made all that available free as long as they did a certain amount every month with us, and we owned the market. But it's looking at things you can do that nobody else in their right mind does. Sometimes you look for a correlation. If I mean, I, was, I, was, I wrote down here, one of the greatest uh, marketing coups that I like, I love the marketing of Ken Fisher, the I'm sure that the, in, you know, the hedge funds or the investors know who Ken Fisher is. And he very straightforwardly does this. He contacts people and says, if you're high net worth, I want to invest in you proprietary intellectual property that we normally reserve for our, our million dollar accounts. I'm doing it for three reasons. One, if you self-invest, I know that if you use this, and com you, can, you can paper trade it, you can compare it against what you do. If it outperforms it, you're going to start using it. Your yields are going to go up. People are going to ask you what you're doing. You're going to get us clients. If you use anybody else, you can paper trade it. And if it, if it validates, you're going to basically give us part of your portfolio, and we want to win it all. And it's very cool. But if you want to be my most trusted advisor, you've got to have a dialogue with me, and it's got to be a, it's called a you conversation. It's all about me, and you've got to really know the mindset. You've got to empathize with them. You've got to have dialogue with them. You've got to put in words for what they want, and I'm trying to go very, very, very fast, so I've got a couple other points. Oh, just on, the, on that, interesting. So we saw SoFi a bit earlier, so, uh, who work with students, and that's exactly the model they're doing, isn't it, which is they're trying to help their students repay. Yep. So if they're, if, you know, they're trying to be their trusted advisor. Yep. And that kind of, but isn't that all expensive for all these platforms? Because effectively, what we're hearing about is platforms want to be technology-driven solutions. It, you know, it, they don't really want to have it, a human interface, although there's debate about that. But they've got no choice, have they? Well, if you're talking about, I mean, if you if the game you're playing is thirty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars a whack, and the more you can help them succeed and trust you, you're not only going to keep getting repeats, but you're going to get ancillaries on that, and ancillaries can be any of the five or seven or whatever you want, not counting other personal. I would think the game you're playing, first of all, is worth it, number one, and it's very possible to move. I mean, the big, the big problem with everybody is, is cost of acquisition. It's not really cost of acquisition. It's how the cost of acquisition is paid because it gets paid up front. Yeah. And so you can convert it all to, I mean, it, it just, it's a, it's a critical thinking. It's just basically shifting your philosophy. You don't have to pay it up front. We've moved, I mean, I've done probably $3 billion of strategic alliances for clients when I started, I had no money. So I had to move everything to a performance basis, a deferred basis, maybe pay them even more than the $200 lead cost, but pay it out. It's so much a month payable as I received it. I've, you know, I've, I've, you know, you can do all kinds of creative things, but uh, there's a great model that that you're talking about the student thing. I think it's Pentaflex, the big the big movie camera company. If you know their back, I'll tell you something else. If you know their background. They started by going to all the college universities that were teaching movies, and they would lend these expensive cameras to everyone that was a film student because they knew that if they were their benefactor by the time they... And the thing is, grow the market, too. Another interesting story, and it's old, but it's very interesting. Uh, Colonial Pen, when they started out, was set up to basically be an affinity-based insurer, and they had a lot of trouble finding affinity groups, so they started their own. They started AARP, so they would have a, a market. So, I mean, there's a lot of cool things you can do. And also, look at corollaries. If, if there's a high uh, correlation to people, if they do this before they do that, not only do you, can you go and, um, and uh, make arrangements with whoever has whatever the first, you know, the, the preemptive pre-access point is, but you can also create that yourself. We've, we've started book companies and, and product companies that broke even or lost a little bit of money because a little bit of money was so much less than in... Um, in the acquisition, we were in the gold business years ago, for example, when it first started and became legal. We did $2 billion in the first 
two years because instead of going in, I have said this, instead of going to all the magazines and Wall Street Journal, we went to all the hard money uh, newsletters and we worked deals where we were the recommended, we were a recommended dealer, we were in their, their welcome kit. We basically had deals where we underwrote three newsletters with us every year. We underwrote things like this and we gave them all the money. When their marketing stopped working because most of them were profit oriented, we were getting leads. If we went in the outside market, a lead for uh, a gold prospective investor might cost us $300. We saw correlations that one out of every 10 subscribers to a gold newsletter would become a big gold buyer, and one out of every half of those would be a big silver buyer, and half of those would be a rare, you know, rare coin, and then half of those would be a, uh, a, uh, a, a gold stock. So we would go and we would underwrite subscription offers for them. And when that wasn't enough, we'd start our own newsletters, but it's a different way of thinking, and I'm not giving those of you who are analytical really cool things for how to look at risk, but you can also change risk by helping, if somebody's risky, but you want to invest in the future, I'll tell you one more story that was very interesting. We had a, we had a company in Louisiana years ago when C paper uh, loan companies were very big and they were huge, and they made deals with the banks before uh, privacy, where when the banks couldn't make a loan because somebody wasn't, I guess you'd call them seasoned enough yet, the banks would go to them, they would compensate the banks, but the bank would set them up so they would come back later, another year later, and it worked out beautifully. But it depends on the game you're playing and the strategy that you really can... What, what are the risks within working with these entrepreneurs? What's going through their minds when they can start being approached by the platforms? What are they going to be concerned about? What, what, what do you need to think... Well, the first thing is you have to tell me, are you, I mean, I, it, this is too global of a question. Are you going after people who have a precedent for this kind of borrowing, or is it the first kind of borrowing? Mm. I can give a different answer depending on what your question is. First kind of borrowing. Okay, first time borrowing. They've never done it before. They don't understand it. They don't know if they can trust you. They don't know the mechanics. They don't know if they can you know, afford it. They don't know if they're going to get burned. I don't care if you're a platform or you're an institution. They feel like you're playing a game that's weighted that they don't understand. If they're not very sophisticated, they're going to have to, you know, they're going to go to their, if they, I mean, if, you know, some of these don't really have a sophisticated CFO. They got a bookkeeper or they've got, you know, an internal account. They're going to go to their CPA. And a CPA, by the way, is a great preemptive arrangement. We used to do work with a company that had 50,000 CPAs and it was like a double endorsement chain. They were built by relationships with three, they had with three of the journals. They basically created relationships for software companies and everybody. There's all kinds of cool ways to do it, but it's all in trying to, if, if you recognize the problems, there's a concept called the Aikido School of Marketing or Strategy, and it's first of all recognizing all the inherent negatives and turning the negative into a, pro, into a positive. So what are the inherent negatives? Okay, well, the inherent negatives, again, if, if I were at SMB and I wanted to first time, and I'd never done it, I'd have to first of all understand that I have to then make sure it made economic sense that the, that the service cost, if it's a, is a factor, is it a, you know, how am I securing it? Number, number two, am I, you know, what are my options? I don't know, you know, it's just a lot of things. How can I trust you to be doing what's in my best interest and the way to do it is to educate me in a way that I can comparatively evaluate to give me a chance to try it very safely. We teach something called risk reversal, which is, believe it or not, applicable in a modified way, even in a financial deals. I know I've got to think about it there, but like we've got risk reversal for real estate agents where they can actually make an offer that is incomparable and takes away most of the risk in the transaction. But you figure out these people have a lot of things they're worried about. They're worried about cash flow. They're worried about competition. They're worried about margins. Doesn't mean they're not all going to be gazelles. And the big gazelles probably aren't going to have a problem getting, getting banked, do you think? So, but somebody can be flat, and they can even be trending down. But it doesn't mean they're not very profitable, and, and their receivables aren't very profitable. And so, I mean, it's just different things. Um, what, what do you think that the entrepreneurs are going to want out of the platforms in practical terms? And they want trust, they want education. Do you think that price is always the key consideration for them? Uh, I think price is only going to be a con key consideration if you can't create trust and if you can't add 
extra value. I think that transactions that work and are successful and that you show, again, and maybe the antithesis of what you want out of the, you know, if the whole idea is no human being ever touches it, no involvement, a bunch of, of very sterile autoresponders, then I don't know that that's really going to work with a, a SMB who's very passionate, very, very fiercely independent, and needs to be understood and 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 trusted but i think if you make if you if you can figure out how to help that person be successful long term and they and they trust you for your intention and that intention is genuine and you can demonstrate it even if they never avail themselves of what you do and you help them and you give them ways to progress without committing so they feel non-threatened and then when the trans and, and and let him do a little trans. If you lose a little on the first trans, see this is a long term game. I think it's much different. I don't know consumer finance, but I would think the game you're playing here. If you win, and you can grow it, and you can and you can uh, expand it to more to more uh, areas and activities is is huge. One last question in terms of mass media. We had Gary talking a bit earlier on about how uh, small business owners use media. Should the platforms here be thinking about using radio, TV? Uh, the only way I would ever use radio or TV is if they're your partner and if you're paying for results. If you basically make them your, your partner, and, and I mean, that, we always did that. You know, everything I've ever done, we used to use a thousand radio stations and we'd never pay for results. We'd pay a piece of a piece of the sale, and if the piece was really high, we'd pay it in installments as it was received. We'd make uh, organizations, affinity groups. I mean, uh, I had a client one time that was a uh, consulting firm, and they basically had long-term deals with three trade publications. They financed all their seminars, and they let them have all the profit after cost, so they wanted just the audience like this. I mean, there's a lot of models. Yeah, I would just not, I mean, speculative marketing is the biggest, that's the biggest risk you can get into. You can move it to only paying for results and it becomes a profit center. And last question here. Um, in terms of speculative market, what kind of budget should people put aside for this kind of thing? Is this a big budget item? Is education going to be expensive? Uh, it needn't be three different ways, and I'll tell you why. Number one... Uh, originally, and, and, and again, Title III didn't work the way it was going to, but a year and a half ago, I had lined up everyone from you know, Damon John, Stephen M. R. We were going to create this incredible repository for, for uh, the, 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 the company that P uh, Peter Einstein has, and I had everything covered. I had everybody who was going to create for us enormous content they'd never done before that was proprietary for... Um, helping nouveau investors learn how to discriminate and what to look for, good, bad risk, and help, help nouveau, um, nouveau fundraisers learn how to basically get, get the psyche of an investor and, and, ha and take away the risk and get them, if they were going to do uh, reward-based, how to build you know, big, big uh, followings. And I had all these people lined up, and all they were going to get was a a variable on the deals that worked or a variable on, on whatever the variable was. And we were going to create advisory groups. Not hard. I mean, uh, you know, Damon's got a, a, a private label deal they created with him with one of the software. It's not hard if you think differently, but it requires... I, I, I would never pay for advertising. I would always make... I would always tie it in. We've created... Uh, it, it's really hilarious. We've created... Uh, iconic advisory groups of outrageous people who either his name were known or their distinction was incredible, we would put a share of the revenue above a metric if the business was already going into uh, the fund. The share would be split two ways. Half would be equally dis di uh, uh, divided to each of the advisors and half would be discretionary. If the advisor extended himself, came and spoke for you, got on the phone and called people for you to make deals or get access or get you endorsers, he or she would get more. And we renewed it every year and it was dynamic. It was in proportion to the, to the problem. There's so many things you can do, but I'm talking marketing strategy and I'm talking about the fact that, um, uh, that you gotta realize this, an SMB, I mean like, 
I have, and, and it's a matter of record, so it's not arrogant. We've done $9 billion or more by being able to look at everything everyone's doing and make what they're doing do better because they have two choices. They can either spend more money on outside or they can make what they're doing better. Most people can make their marketing, their strategy, their access to the market, their message, their, their leads, convert more, all these things. If you help them on that, you're going to help them grow. If you help them grow, they're going to have more recurring cash flow to service whatever they borrow from you. And it's, it depends on the game you want to play. We're going to have to call it a day there. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you. You're a great interview. I don't know if I'm a good answer. Thank but you very thank much. You.